Welcome to the Viewless Wings Poetry Podcast, where we celebrate the craft of poetry. Each week, we feature interviews with incredible poets, songwriters, and artists, including Olivia Gatwood, Safia El Hilo, Dana Joya, and many more. We also feature periodic submitted poetry episodes. Visit viewlesswings.com to submit your original poetry. I'm your host, James Moorhead, Poet Laureate of Dublin, California, and author of Canvas, Portraits of Red and Gray, and The Plague Doctor. Hit subscribe and follow me on Instagram or threads at Viewless Wings. Caitlin Conlon is a poet and avid reader who lives in upstate New York. She has a BA in English and a creative writing certificate from the University of Buffalo and, while there, was chosen for the Friends of the University Library's Undergraduate Poetry Prize and the Arthur Axelrod Memorial Prize for Poetry. Caitlin has previously been published via the Upstairs Quarterly and Rust and Moth, among others. The Surrender Theory is her first collection of poetry. A trigger warning for listeners. The book being discussed contains sensitive material related to death, grief, and mental health. If you are in need of health, please contact a professional. Caitlin, welcome to the Viewless Wings Poetry Podcast. Thank you so much. I am so excited to be here today. Well, I'm really excited to talk about your poetry and your book, The Surrender Theory. So let's start right there. The Surrender Theory, which is also the title of two poems. The poems in this collection give the title multiple meanings. How did you select the title of this collection and what does the title mean to you? That's a great question. So I am notoriously bad with book titles. Um, I haven't, I, this is my first book, but I was, when I was putting it together for the longest time, I just had no idea. I kept saving it as untitled manuscript qu with question marks next to it because I just had no idea what I was going to call it. Um, the Surrender Theory, the poem, the very first poem I wrote, uh, I think it was actually also the first poem that I wrote in this book. It just ended up being the first one chronologically in the book. I kept returning to that poem as I was reading. Uh, James, as you know, when you're going through a book, editing it, you always, those first few ones, I think at least for me, stick in my head as I'm reading over and over and over, going over them. And I got to this point where I had read the book so much that I realized the feelings that I've put in this poem, The Surrender Theory, don't necessarily reflect my feelings now, the person I am now. And that's how I came to write The Surrender Theory Part Two. And once I had done that, I realized I've created this arc here with the surrender theory from beginning to end. And it just at that point felt like the natural title for the book. It kind of fell into my hands, thankfully. <laughs> That's interesting yeah, how titles are impossible to find until you find them. And then they were sitting there all along. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Just waiting for you to pick them up. <laughs> so the, uh, the handwritten notes are a key design element of this book, almost as if they're notes pulled from a scrapbook. Talk about the role these notes play and how you approach the design of the surrender theory with your publisher. Yes. So I first built my poetry platform on Instagram, where I was making posts that are often handwritten in my handwriting. And that kind of became sort of a calling card, so to speak, for my work online. And I I knew as I was putting this book together that I wanted to have that personal element first as a nod to that platform that has given me the ability to make this book, but also the subject matter is just so close to me, close to my heart. It felt like I really needed another personal element to just tie it all together to make it feel as real as it felt for me as I was putting the book together. As far as working with my publisher, um, she was very receptive, very open to including these handwritten pages, which I was very thankful for. Um, and it was a pretty easy process. I just sent her my scans and she put them in so I didn't have to worry about <laughs> the formatting, which definitely was a, a fear of mine as I was coming up with the idea to do those handwritten pages. No, and it's cool that it is in your handwriting. I, I, I kind of suspected that it was, but I think that's a great uh, that's a great design element and really makes you want to have the physical book. I did first read this as an ebook, yeah. and then I bought the physical book, uh, which I'm really glad that I did. It benefits from that. 
So the core of your book explores grief in multiple ways. In Nesting Doll, you write, My grandmother's death is a big grief, the size of, maybe, a medicine ball. Anything bigger than that is no longer grief. It is hopelessness, which is generally much worse. How do you approach writing poems that are so personal, so emotionally intense and charged, while still having a critical eye for editing and revision? Well, I've definitely gotten better at it over the years. I feel like when I first started writing about grief, I was too close to it to look at it accurately, if that makes sense. Um, I kind of found that for me, when I'm writing about things that are so tender, so laden with grief and personal experience, that I have to have a little bit of distance from that situation in order to look at it with a poet's eye and also a non-biased eye. Uh, so for the surrender theory, a lot of the poems that I wrote about my grandmother, um, that's one of the primary griefs in this, this book, but not the only one, um, for those poems, I had to have at least like a year, year to year and a half distance from her death in order to really feel like I was writing about it in a way that was meaningful and true to who I am. I still feel that way. I, I still feel like I need distance from subjects in order to write about them. But I think just the more you write about your personal life or the more you write about difficult emotions, the easier it becomes to look at them with the writer's eye versus the personal, I am feeling this, what do I do with it? I, that all of us have. <laughs> yeah, no, I think distance from a subject can be really <laughs> helpful in general. And it also will help you step out of yourself and see yourself as a third party. But that's something I've tried to do with a poem that uh, I wrote about. I miss, we may have done this on the live stream. I can't remember. But I wrote a poem about being mugged at the age of 10. And uh, it was a really hard thing to write. And I had to think about it as mm -hmm. though I was writing about somebody else. And then it became mm -hmm. a little bit easier. Yes. So Echo and Depression Revisited are two examples of very short poems just a few lines each. As I've brought up on this podcast with several poets, short poems are deceptively difficult to write. How do you approach writing a short poem in editing a poem down to just a few lines? And maybe your Instagram Instapoet <laughs> experience early on maybe contributed to that. Well, I will echo what you said and say that it is very difficult, I think, to write a short poem to really feel like you've captured everything you want to say. Something that I found for me is I've I've made a Word document called the uh, Poetry Graveyard. And what I do is when I'm editing poems down, if I have a feeling that a poem wants to be shorter, I'll take all of those pieces that I love and can't bear to get rid of, but no will stop it from being a short poem and put them in this Poetry Graveyard so that I know they're safe, they're somewhere else, and I can return to them, and they're not lost to, you know, the ether. <laughs> um, so I guess a lot of writing short poems for me is writing something, getting all of the feelings out, and then cutting down bit by bit until I figure out what I'm really trying to say with a piece. The poetry graveyard. I love that idea. That's a way to edit out things and, not, and, and, and remove the fear that it's lost forever. And you may never go back to that graveyard and unearth any of those things, but you, it removes the fear that they're going to be lost or forgotten. That's a great idea. So I think that could apply in general when you're cutting things that, you, that you're really hesitant to cut, but you kind of know you got to cut them, put them in a safe box. Yeah, that's really, really okay. cool. Exactly. Even if you never come back to them, you know, they're there, you know, it, there's, it takes away that element of <laughs> overwhelming fear. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the series of poems in the Depression Notes vary in form and in length, some appearing like excerpts from a journal, including lines like, I'm still naming my mistakes after cities I've cried in. How did this poem develop? So this poem developed over many months. I knew that I wanted to try and write a poem about depression and my experiences with it, how it's impacted my life and the people around me. And I found that I kept starting it and then stopping it. It just never felt like I was on the right path with it. 
over time, I'd accumulated a bunch of smaller pieces that I felt were capturing these feelings of depression, but didn't quite fit together. And I came up with this idea to do the depression notes, because that's often how depression kind of manifests for me is in these periods of specific sorts of sadness that really can't be put together into one piece. So it kind of felt like the natural way for me to get this feeling across was to look at all of these quote unquote depression notes that I'd taken and then see where they could fit together, if they could even fit together in a longer piece. Mm -hmm. I had never done anything like that before. This was my first time trying it and I did end up liking what happened, but it really was an experiment. I wasn't sure if it would really come across since all of the pieces are, though connected by this similar sort of feeling, are different in content and what they look at and even metaphorical versus literal mentions or words in them. Well, I thought the title was an effective way to set up that approach that made it work mm -hmm. really, really well. So now I, I, that poem was very, series of poems uh, was very powerful. So the poem Clairvoyance employs a unique form that mimics the internal conversations we all have with ourselves. Here's an excerpt. At eight years old, I was psychic. No, I killed the plant. No, I ran away from home on a plastic rowboat that my grandmother and I raced down the creek behind our house. Talk about constructing this poem and coming up with this this approach and uh, what you chose to include and what you ultimately edited out. And now I know put in your graveyard. <laughs> yes. So this poem in particular was an interesting one. I was, I wrote this, I think it must've been 2020. It was during the pandemic where there weren't open mics. I wasn't going to in-person workshops or retreats or anything. And I had a group of friends that I was Zooming with once or twice a week where we would just sit and write poems together. And I can't quite remember what the prompt was, but I started writing what would become clairvoyance. And I have this, <laughs> I have this tendency when I'm writing poems to go off so metaphorical that it's not quite the truth, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think that's a natural thing that poets do. We invent, we're creating worlds, creating stories. And as I was writing this poem, I felt myself doing that. And at that first break where I say no was kind of me in this moment saying, no, wait a second. I want to write the real thing. I want to write the thing that's really here. And after I did that, I realized maybe I could play with this a little bit. So I went through and the poem kind of unfolded from there, me going off on these metaphorical, though inspired heavily inspired by true events and then saying, no, wait a second, what actually happened? And that gave me a sort of avenue to explore this feeling of how, you know, grief really does warp the way we look at the past mm -hmm. and the way that our present self looks at it versus our, the person that was in that moment. And now for, uh, for people listening, you, know, you can't see it, but the, the, you know, there's slashes and capitalized nose, and it really, uh, it's, it's sort of almost like a variation on a prose poem intermixed with form, and it's really, uh, really effective visually, and, and it just gets this, it, as I was reading it, I was thinking of these arguments you have with yourself inside your head that nobody can hear, but they're so loud in your head, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so your poem, Benjamin Button, closes with a wonderful line. I'll never be older than when I was 19. And half conditional statements ends with, then be comforted knowing that you are still alive. They are lines, particularly in the context of this book that rattled in my mind. How do you approach the ending of poems? And where do you know the endings is just right and where it's too much and you got to chop some back? Oh, I feel like I'm still figuring it out, <laughs> to tell you the truth. I, I find that some endings I you know, I'll go into a poem and I know where it wants to end. I know where the poem wants to get to. It's kind of figuring out how it gets there that is the, the problem. And then sometimes it's the opposite where I have a beginning and I have an image that I want to explore and I get into it and I wonder where exactly am I going with this? Um, something that's helped me is, of course, refining the editing process. And for me, that looks like figuring out if I'm having a difficult time with an ending, 
figuring out what the thesis statement of my poem is. If mm -hmm. I had to pick out one idea, what do I want the reader to get from this? And that has often helped me figure out the ending because then it's easier to visually see, okay, I want the reader to get this. Where are they not getting it? Or where is it already in the poem? Um, I've recently taken to rearranging poems, which is not something that I've, I really was experimenting with in the past, but I found that sometimes just switching two stanzas, really you find mm -hmm. your ending already in the poem and you just have to put it in the right place, which can be a lot of fun. <laughs> now, how is your, uh, as you're um, starting an Instagram and, you know, taking little snippets of a poem or rethinking it, like how has that influenced how you look at poetry? I think it's influenced, influenced it both in good ways and bad ways. I think in the good sense, it's kind of given me a way to read my audience and see what's clicking with people. Um, but in a more negative sense, though, I guess, you know, all negatives can also be looked at as positive positives, but it has made me kind of think as I'm writing a poem, what are the like, the big lines here? What are those lines that are going to make people gasp or make people emotional, rather than just writing naturally without thinking about mm -hmm. where's my line of impact. Um, I think that's something I'm still kind of unlearning and I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to think about how are these lines going to impact my readers. But I think overall Instagram has kind of made me very aware of what audiences like and what people on the internet at least like to read, which uh, whether you like it or not, does influence the way you write when you're alone. Yeah, and I think that I was talking to Dana Joya recently, and all of the different ways that poetry can get out in the world now has only enhanced poetry and expanded the yeah. audience and created awareness. And so I think it's a, it's a good thing. Yeah, I, I played a little bit uh, on Instagram with how to take pieces out of my poems that weren't intended to be standalone, but you know, yeah. uh, but I could see what you mean that if you were starting with Instagram, you could you may over rotate on the on the impact line. In, and uh, so that's right. something to be aware of. Yeah, that's really, really fascinating. So we've talked uh, already about the, the poetry you've written in this book about your grandmother. So touching and personal. And yet this really touches on emotions we've all felt or will feel. So how did writing these poems help you work through these emotions? And how have your readers shared the impact of these poems on them? The writing for me was very cathartic. Um, it felt like, I feel like maybe this is something everyone experiences, but when you're going through a situation that is so, so completely yours, it can often feel very isolating. Like nobody else has ever felt this feeling and what am I supposed to do with it? And what I did with it was write about it and write about it and write about it until I had said what I was feeling and felt like I'd conveyed this isolating experience. And then bringing in the part of your question about readers, it was so incredible to me when this book came out in the months after it came out, having people reach out and say, I went through something so similar, which really took me by surprise. I, I had thought, you know, who else... <laughs> maybe seem silly now, but the premise of this book is that I was going through the, uh, the loss of my grandmother. And then very soon after that, I went through my first breakup. So it was just all of the feelings at once. And I was blown away by the number of people that reached out and said, I was something very similar happened to me. I lost somebody and then my romantic relationship wasn't working out. And it felt so validating for my own experiences, which is not something I was looking for with putting the book out, at least not consciously. I wasn't looking for this validation of my feeling, but through listening to people and talking to readers and having, feeling that validation, it just felt like such a gift to be given something in return for this writing, this feeling of togetherness and closeness with strangers. Yeah, I had a chance to, uh, as part of my Poet Laureate of Dublin, uh, California, go into high school classes recently and, um, you know, read some of my poetry and then tell the students it, it, there's no correct interpretation of this. It's just how you respond to it. And I was just blown away by the different ways in which poems that I wrote that were very personal to me connected in totally different ways. 
And yeah. I think that was a reminder to me that you don't have to write, you don't need a big, you know, Lord of the Rings style mega <laughs> idea to write a poem that po the ideas can be very personal. They can be very yeah. small and they can really resonate. And that's what I think makes poetry so magical is that ability for a really personal, small idea to take on much bigger meaning. It's cool. Um, so in the latter half of the surrender theory, you have a wonderful series of love poems in blue sky, love. I sing you happy. You write, if I'd known that the smoke of heartache led to you, I would have put on running shoes and barreled through it head first. Writing love poems that are fresh and novel is tricky because so many have been written. You know, <laughs> poetry, death, and love and are two popular topics in poetry. So how do you approach how did you approach writing love poems while avoiding the landmines in every direction of cliches and greeting card poetry? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I find that love poems can be difficult for that reason you've described. I think cliches become cliches because they are so often true or so often relatable. You know, I, I, I get why cliches are there because I feel them. And I think everyone that's really in love with somebody else feels them too. For me, what I have tried to do in the surrender theory and since the surrender theory is focus in on those the smaller elements of love. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, there's a poem in this book, one, two, three, four, that's about um, my now fiance bringing me a piece of cheese um, from the kitchen as he's making our, making our dinner. And that for me, <laughs> it's funny. Sometimes a moment happens and you think it's a free poem right in front of me, this moment that I don't even have to invent. It's just here. And ready for me to write about it. And that was one of those smaller moments that I kind of latched onto and wrote around. Um, of course, there are some longer love poems in there, like the one you just referenced, Blue Sky Love, I Sing You Happy. Um, and that one also just kind of started with a small moment, which was that um, the title of that piece, my fiance and I were at a library that had magnetic poetry. And that was the, uh. that was the line we made together <laughs> and I took a picture of it and said I need to do something else with this I can't just leave it here on the on the wall <laughs> um so yeah I, I've kind of gone off on a tangent but yes just finding those little moments and then expanding them I think it maybe helps us not fall into those cliches because they're more personal and specific to what we've experienced. Well, congratulations on being engaged. And, uh, and I hope your fiance mm -hmm. knows that, uh, uh, that marrying a poet means that that person you're marrying is constantly on the hunt for <laughs> poetic lines and inspiration. So my wife uh, is the, has been the victim of that for multiple decades now. So, uh, so one more question before I hand the mic over to you. The surrender theory is ultimately full of hope, despite the pain you so effectively capture in poetry. In For Anyone That Knew Me Intimately in 2017, you close the poem with, If you remember anything about me, I hope it is how brave I became in the aftermath. What do you hope readers struggling with grief and depression take away from your book? I My hope with this book is that people read it and feel less lonely in the way that we've kind of already talked about this feeling of togetherness in grief, because though it is isolating and though every feeling and situation is so specific to the person experiencing it, there is this overarching sensation of knowing that people have been through this thing and then survived it and gone on to feel hopeful and that was definitely the arc I wanted with this book. I did not want it to end on this feeling of grief that is just never ending and hard to carry and just something that you're not able to put down. What I wanted to do with the ending in which I think I hopefully accomplished was let the readers know that grief will still be with you. It will be a part of your life once you experience it, but it isn't something that has to impact your life in this negative way and bring you down. What I learned from writing this book was that grief is just so much 
love. <laughs> People have written about this over and over, how grief is just love in, you know, a different shape, different form. And that's, that is what I took from the writing of this book. And I'm hoping that when people read it, they get that feeling and then also see she's feeling these things, but she is not letting it, you know, bring her all the way down and keeping her there, so to speak. <laughs> no, I think that that's what I think makes this book so powerful is that it does have that arc. And that if you had written the book earlier and didn't have that other side, it, the power would be diminished somewhat. And uh, so it's really good. Yes, I think if, for anyone who's listening, and if you are, you know, experiencing depression, please seek help. And also, I think you will find comfort and hope in this book. So with that, it's the perfect time to turn the mic over to you to read some selections from The Surrender Theory. This is Ode to Dry Shampoo. Diligent can of oil absorbing magic. Beauty product must have go-to. Keeper of hair care secrets and last night's misadventures, I bow down to your grease-fighting abilities in the name of social acceptance. Silver cloud composed of linings, I'd call you a miracle if I could pronounce your ingredients. The way you nestle into my scalp and tango with my purple comb could put any dancer to shame. Your patience with my body has not gone unnoticed. It's funny how people want to understand your mental illness until you exhibit undesirable symptoms. It's all, let me know if you need anything, until you run out of energy to take care of yourself. The trash bag sits by the door. The bed sheets grow heavy, then lazy enters the conversation, and where can you go from that? Sometimes when you're depressed, you can't shower. By you, I mean I, and by can't, I mean what's the point of being good to your body if your body hasn't been good to you? I mean all I want to do is sleep. When I'm dreaming, I don't have to think. To bring soap to skin and scrub existential dread away, watch the drain swallow me up is risky and exhausting. I swear it is. I swear it is. Dry shampoo. I'm trying my hardest, even though doing so puts you out of a job. Dry shampoo. I'm supposed to feel guilty when I lift your cap, press your nozzle. I just want to leave the house without worrying that everyone will know how utterly disgusting I feel. Yes, I know it's disgusting. I know it isn't healthy. Stop acting like I'm ignorant to my faults when you have the privilege of stepping away from this monster I sustain. It's a terrible beast my brain. If you haven't known depression's hot breath on your neck, I suppose it wouldn't make sense. Sympathy always draws a line somewhere, often where it's most needed. Dry shampoo. In a world that will only value me if my self-destruction is hidden, you comfort me. You never pass judgment. You acknowledge me when I come to you crusty eyed and desperate for help. You do something about it. That poem is one that I wrote. I think I tell the story every time I read the poem, but I think it's worth saying. So I will continue to repeat it until somebody tells me not to. And that is that I was lucky enough to read this poem at a, um, I had won an award for the poem and I was able to read it out loud to a, a group of peers and professors at the University of Buffalo, which is where I got my bachelor's degree. And I was really nervous to read the poem because it's it touches on some sensitive topics for me. And afterwards, after I had read the poem, I was, you know, mingling with the the faculty and a professor I didn't know that had I had never spoken to before came up to me and said, maybe you should just shower as a joke. And it made me so angry, so unbelievably angry that I could get up there and read this poem and have that be mm -hmm. the thing that was taken away from it. So when I was putting together the surrender theory, I knew <laughs> at the very beginning of this book, I knew that this poem had to be in there because it, it was my way of saying to this person and to anyone else that might have come away with that feeling like this is my experience this is 
valid to share and you don't get to tell me how to feel about it sort of thing. Oh my goodness. Yes, that's, I know I'm not supposed to ask questions after all three, but that, <laughs> that I would say that is a completely missing the point observation from that individual. Um, yeah. Yes. So good for you for not being deterred uh, no. by that um, pretty crass feedback. Anyways, back to Mike, back to you. Yes. <clears throat> This next one is Ode for the Girls That Camp Out for Concerts. This is for the dirt-stained beauty queen street sleepers made of resilience and dollar store glitter. The girls that can turn a half-empty bag of make makeup wipes into a full body shower. The girls that keep buying the cheapest item on the local fast food menu so they can use their bathroom. The girls that pray to dry shampoo and deodorant, spray it generously over anyone that needs it. The girls that make friends with security and tell them about their parents, how they don't know that they're here, curled up on a sidewalk, how they think they're at a sleepover with a friend from high school that isn't actually their friend anymore, watching movies, gossiping about nothing. The girls applying eyeshadow in the reflections of storefront windows, unfazed by every person that walks past and dares to roll their eyes. There is something holy about girls so dedicated to melody that they give up their basic needs for it. Live off of bottled water and bulk-sized bags of goldfish crackers just for the chance to touch something intangible. To show off tattoos they got while holding hands with one another, screaming the words to a song that saved their life or makes them happy or maybe just reminds them of how beautiful it is to be alive. How absolutely wonderful it is to sing in a crowd that knows every key change by heart. The girls that have only ever been a part of something bigger than themselves. The girls that wave pride flags and kiss their partners and hand out hair ties like their compliments. The girls that trade water with strangers, lips to lips to lips, trusting that everyone here is safe because they are. They have to be. How else would they have gotten through the door? Why else would they have sweat through their t-shirts or shivered through their jeans, borrowed their uncle's old tent and stretched out on blankets that have seen better days? What, why else, if it isn't some sort of untouchable magic? A silent understanding that everybody belongs in this collective space. This is for the girls that look discomfort in the face until it backs away in shame. The girls that tuck portable phone chargers in their back pockets and memorize set lists. The girls with ripped band shirts and flower crowns. The girls waking up the next morning at 6 a.m. for reality. The girls without a family that understands the weird mix of heartbreak and joy they're capable of holding in their hands. The girls that believe you are heard. You are seen. You are here to stay. I wrote this one after sitting outside with a group of friends for a very long time <laughs> uh, at a general admission show. It was outdoors, the sun was scorching, and then after about two hours of sitting in the sun, it started to rain on all of us. And it was this miserable experience, but I was just looking around at all of these girls and women around me that were sharing in this feeling of or rather sharing in this experience of misery in order to do this one thing, this one special thing, which is watch a show together. I thought it was just so beautiful. And I felt really grateful to be sitting in the middle of all these wonderful people being able to look at what they were doing and kind of pull that into this poem, which is mm -hmm. one of my personal favorites, I think, from the book. <laughs> this is the final poem I'm going to read for you today. This one is The Woman I Was. The woman I was at 19 cries in car washes, not because she's sad, but because sometimes it feels like the right thing to do. Like putting on lipstick to go to the supermarket or waving goodbye until everything is the back of your hand. She wipes off her face when she spots daylight at the tunnel's end defines affection in terms of how she's received it and not by what she herself has given, which is to say that she does not define it in a way that allows her to sleep at night. She's timid, believes with her chest that love is never going to find her. She isn't stupid. 
She just hasn't come to terms with loss yet. She doesn't know how to part with someone without building them a commemorative statue. Her hands remain a bloodied mess of thorn and memory. Years later, I recognize that the pressure I placed on her to be healthy was anything but. That the lonely methods she tried to heal by were not chosen in ignorance, but in hope that this, maybe, finally, will work out. And of course, none of them did, but it wasn't her fault. Ignorant isn't the worst thing a young person can be. I step out of my body, unfold forgiveness, and hand it to her, the woman I was at 19. She smooths down the creases of the page and reads this. It's okay that you spent so much time painting yourself the color of your background. You haven't made a home in anything that you cannot shed the skin of. Mm. Mm. So wonderful hearing uh, poetry in the voice of the poet. And a uh, couple of additional questions before we, before we wrap. So an ode to dry tampoo, uh, you incorporate humor, very hard to do, especially in a poem that is you know, fundamentally not about, you should take a shower to that yeah. person you mentioned, yeah. but you know, about some of the, the banal realities of depression. You know, I think it was such a, it put a spotlight on such a specific detail and then incorporated humor. Like I'd call you a miracle if I could pronounce your ingredients. So uh, how do you approach, I've asked this of multiple poets because it's tricky. How do you approach <laughs> achieving a balance of, of capturing the essence of a very serious subject while keeping it accessible and even infusing some humor? Because even in the darkest situation, there is, um, there is humor, you know, stand up comedians are notoriously depressed and yeah. <laughs> uh, and and yet they find such humor in the world so uh, what have you um you know learned about incorporating humor i've learned that what's key is really figuring out if a poem needs it and where it could benefit from the humor so looking at this poem specifically i wanted to start with humor because if you just look at the title, it's kind of, it seems like it's going to be a fun sort of poem, you know, dry shampoo, lots of people use it. You know, I wanted to kind of start with this sort of fun exterior so that when I turned it and talked about what dry shampoo really meant to, really meant to me, that it would feel even sharper, which is kind of, I think, how a lot of depressed people when they, at least for me, I don't want to speak <laughs> to everyone as a whole, but in my experience, you know, you put on this face of everything's funny and good and happy, but then in the interior is just like this mess of hurt and feelings and blue, overwhelming blue. Um, so that was kind of what I wanted to replicate with this piece was the two different sides of depression. You can look at it, as you brought up, many comedians talk about their mental health, which is often not great. And they have the funny spin to it, but then there's the sad spin to it. You can tell the same story in two different ways and get two very different uh, reactions from mm -hmm. it, though it's the same subject. Well, I was uh, excited to hear you read Ode for the Girls at Camp Out for Concerts, a poem I immediately wanted to read out loud to perform, and I shared with <laughs> folks I know that are that I'm into live music and that, that love that whole experience. Um, so what role does reciting your poetry out loud, either to yourself, a mirror, or your fiance, hopefully they realize how many poems they'll be the audience for. Um, how does that help you in the revision and editing process? What role does that play? It is so important to my editing and revision. Um, I had, I had a professor in college that um, encouraged us as we were editing. I'd never done this before to read the poems out loud and feel how they feel in your mouth. Like what, what's going on as you're reading it. And I found in those earlier poems, um, not in this book, just in my career as a whole, I guess as a writer, um, I found that I would stumble over my words a lot. And that was an indicator for me that probably I was not writing it in the, the most fluid way that I could. Um, something I also like to do is read a poem out loud and record it. And sometimes this is kind of rare now, but it was, Anyway, <laughs> um, something I like to do is record myself reading the poems and see where 
I change a word as I'm reading, Mm -hmm. like editing in real time, which is always really interesting to me that sometimes when you're writing a poem, you see all the words and it all clicks. But then as you're reading out it out loud, it wants to be something else. And I find that that is a really useful tool in revision. And especially with this poem, which I think feels like a very spoken word sort of poem, especially when I read out loud, I think it feels it kind of dances off the page when oh, I yeah. read it up. Um, this was one that I read over and over until I kind of felt like I was in that rhythm and that, that was really valuable when I was putting that piece together. Yeah, that's something where I wrote for decades sort of quietly for myself, shared some things with friends and family before I got serious about publishing. And uh, I never read my poems out loud. Uh, I'd be self-conscious and I realized that really does... Um, restrict your ability to edit and revise if you don't read the poetry out loud. You just, you'll hear things, like you said, you'll hear things, you'll change things that your mind won't do when it's reading inside your head. It's just not the same. Yeah, exactly. So we, uh, just one more question. Um, You've built a sizable following on Instagram, uh, which is tricky to do, and there's some luck involved and there's some skill involved. What have you learned from uh, from social media in terms of having it be an effective complement to your to, to your poetry, and then what are you working on next? Ooh. Hmm. I think what I've learned from being on social media and writing this book is I've learned the balance between writing for myself and writing for other people. So I felt like at first on Instagram, I didn't realize I was doing it, but I was definitely writing in the, in the vein of wanting people to follow me or like wanting the likes, wanting the platform, which is hard because a a big part of publishing now, if you're going with traditional publishers is they look at those numbers. So there is an element of wanting to do that, wanting to reach people, but also wanting to write authentically to yourself. So I think Instagram has has kind of taught me how to balance that, how to pick out those lines to post those, um, I can't remember what I called them earlier, those um, key lines mm-hmm. that- The impact will, lines, I think you said. Impact yeah. lines, that's yeah. what I said. Uh, those impact lines to post while still being true to my voice and my writing. And I think there's also an element with social media where um, you you just want to make sure that you're not just reading poetry on social media, but you're also kind of broadening your horizons and reading all sorts of things. Because I feel like sometimes if you're reading a lot of the same sort of shorter poetry over and over, it, you kind of get into like a, I don't want to say a rut because it's not a bad style of poetry. It's a style of poetry I love, but um just, you know, focusing on the same thing over and over. Mm -hmm. So I think social media has really given me a lot, but I've also, as I've gotten older and as I've played with it a little more, found out what its use is versus, or what its use is in my work as a whole, if that makes sense. And then to answer your question about what I'm working on now, I'm working on my next book. I am so excited about it. Um, No dates or publication, you know, news on that right now. But I will say that it's something I'm really excited about. And it kind of explores the idea of performance and how we perform in different roles throughout our lives and kind of how that culminates and festers. And I'm just really excited about all of that. <laughs> so, well, we look forward to having you back on when your uh, when your book is is your next book is ready. It's been uh, wonderful talking to you, Caitlin. Thank you so much for sharing your poetry and your voice on the Viewless Wings Poetry Podcast today. Thank you again for having me here. It is always so nice to talk with you, James. Thank you. The Viewless Wings Poetry Podcast is written and produced by James Moorhead. You can follow me on Instagram, Threads, and YouTube at Viewless Wings. Hit subscribe to be notified of every episode of the Viewless Wings Poetry Podcast and spread the word with your poetry community.